Welcome to the NSX Advanced Load Balancer Operations Workshop video series. My name is Sean and today we're going to continue to talk about understanding virtual services. The topics for today will be around placement, analytics, as well as evaluating failures. And these are failures around the pool members and the pools. So let us jump right into the, the RDP session. So here I'm in the AVI controller. We see we have all these virtual services. These virtual services were created throughout this, this series. So what we wanna to do to first is talk about placement. So where is our virtual service being placed? Where are the pools being placed? How, how is all that interface placement occurring? We've seen we created a virtual service, but we never actually understood yet how is that placement occurring? When we were looking through the different options inside of virtual service, we saw in the advanced, there is a way to do a placement network. Now, all this does is when you select it, it's gonna give you all the port groups that the cloud has learned. So we can actually force our service engines to bind this interface. So if I select AVI internal as an example, it'll actually mount this port group on its interface, on the VIP interface. Or I could select one of these other ones. The one we used for the VIP placement is actually VIP region A01, but this was auto learn. Now, how, how did the cloud know to use this port group? Well, let's take a step back. So our virtual services are on the 192, 168, 130, network. This is the slash 24. So the cloud knows that it needs to place this virtual service, this IP on a service engine that has the same network exposed. If we wanted to find these networks, it would be under infrastructure and networks. And here we see a bunch of different names and other fields like discovered subnets and configured subnets. These names are actually the port groups in my vCenter server. If I scroll down, I have this VIP region A01 and it has the IP of 192.168.130/24. So this is how the cloud knew where to place that virtual service. If I open it, we see I have all these different names so we can recognize a couple of them. VS VIP AVI Networks, VS VIP Layer 4 Secure App, VS VIP Secure App 01. And we see some other ones called SEG01A with a suffix, S-E-K-K-R-S-R-E-X-Z-E-F. These are the service engine names. So our service engines get their interface and we have our virtual service IPs. This is how our clouds are dynamically learning where to place those virtual service IPs. We have a network with that subnet. Likewise, our pools are 172.16.20/24 network. Now there's two ways to discover these IPs. You either do it automatically and it's that's done through the cloud, the cloud would log into the vCenter environment and discover which subnets are under what port groups. The other way is to set the IP and set a static range. So if we check that VIP subnet, we've actually configured a static range. And you can see that static range right here from dot 90 to dot 119. So as long as your cloud can understand where to place a virtual service, and that would be by the IP that you have configured. So if we jump back to our virtual applications and we jump back to virtual service, we have this IP configured. So as long as our cloud knows where to place that network and we've auto learned those port groups, then you're good to go. But if it hasn't learned it, then you can control the placement under the virtual service. And that's under advanced and the add placement network here. There are other use cases like BGP um, where you wanna manually do this placement, but that will be discussed when you get into the architecture section. And again, if you were gonna do placement for pools, say that network wasn't automatically learnt, you can do the pool placement as well. And that's under this add server network. So if we click here, we see the exact same thing, all of our port groups, and you can select whatever one that's meant for that pool. 
Great, that's placement. I guess one other interesting thing would be scaling out. So let's touch on that real quick. I have three service engines. One of them is not being used. So let's see what IPs we have on this one. So I'm gonna highlight over here and I just wanna check what interfaces I have. So I have a bunch of interfaces, but no IPs assigned. Now, if I compared it to another service engine, let's check this one. So it has a bunch of um, virtual services configured to it. So let's see if we have the same thing. And we already see there's an IP configured. So that other, this, virtual, this service engine actually has nothing configured to it. No virtual services exist on it, but these two do have virtual services. Now, if I wanted to scale out my virtual service to this service engine, can you imagine what would happen? Well, if you look at this, there's no interfaces configured on it right now, right? There's no pool backend, there's no virtual service front end. So this service engine needs to get a front end interface configured and a back end interface configured, as well as acquire IPs for those front end and back ends. And that comes to placement. So let's go through that operation and see how long it takes. So I'm gonna do it for this Hackazon app. And we're gonna do the scale out operation. And let's select the one that isn't being used and it's this guy. So let's scale out. Now you can see here, it's actually waiting for that VNIC addition. So it does take a little bit of time for that service engine to acquire its IP. That was pretty quick. And look, it looks like it's already got its IP and we should be now able to go and check it out. So let's drop this down, Hackazon app. And the Hackazon app also exists on this service engine. So we should see two interfaces on this service engine now. There's one and that's the VIP front end. So this is the same network as our VIP network. And then where's our backend pool? Here's our backend pool. So 172.16.20.164. So it looks like this one was dynamically learned. So we're using IPAM. So we saw that range of IPs. We acquired a range, one, one of the IPs from that range and we set it as a static IP. But for our backend server network, it looks like we're using DHCP and that reflects here. We've learned it via DHCP. And if we wanted to double check, we jump back to networks and we'll just open this. And yep, DHCP is enabled. So that's why that IP was obtained via DHCP. Cool. Next, let's look at pools. We did create a new pool in our past video and that's the demo dash pool. If I highlight over here, we see that it's unused. So what I wanna do first is I wanna enable that pool. So I'm gonna use this Abbey Networks virtual service and I'm just gonna change the pool to the demo pool. We'll save and hopefully our virtual service will still be up. Perfect, our virtual service is still up. Now that we've set that demo pool, let's send some curl commands to it. So we're gonna clear this up a bit and 192.168.130.93. So double check that IP, yep. So we'll send a curl, 400 bad requests, hmm, interesting. And this one doesn't seem to be responding very quick. I'm just gonna exit out of this one and I'll send another one. 200 okay, so this is what we want. 200 okay, that's good. 400 bad requests, okay. And this one looks like it's timed out again. And 200, okay. So it looks like we're going in a bit of a circle. We've got a 400 request, then we time out, and then we get a 200, okay. And then it just keeps happening the same rotation. So let's take a look at the logs. So checking the logs, we have our 200, okay. So K8's worker O2A. So this guy's responding with a 200, okay. Now let's check the next one. Oh, interesting, 1.1.1.1. And the 475 is actually coming back from the load balancer. It's not even reaching the backend server. Okay, interesting. And then 400, here's our 400. 
Okay, that's hitting the backend server, but the backend server is sending the 400. And this is KH Worker 01A. So KH Worker 01A is responding, and KH Worker 02A is responding, while the 1.1.1 is, isn't is responding. We're just getting a 475 back from the load balancer itself. So it looks like something fishy is going on. <clears throat> so we'll go check out that pool. And aha, interesting. We only have the passive health monitor enabled. So what does this mean? Remember when we talked about the health monitors, passive health monitor will actually not remove a pool if it's, if it's not responding properly. All the passive health monitor do does is check for uh, less ideal responses such as TCP resets or 5XX code. If it gets a 5XX code or a TCP reset as an example, maybe the load balancer will stop sending clients to those backend servers as often. So this is kind of an issue for us because you see we're getting 400 responses as well as um, timeouts. So this isn't good for the clients when they're talking to the application. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly add a health monitor and then we'll see what we have. All right, let's save this. We'll wait a little bit. Um, but already you can see two out of three. Two out of three have... Uh, so one's been removed already. So let's see what's going to happen if we go back to the curl. So 200 okay, 200 okay. So now it looks like we're getting responses we want. Let's jump back to those servers. We're just going to click servers here and we now see two were removed. If we wanted to see what those errors were, clicking on Kate's worker 01, we, we can see which health monitors are in effect. We have our passive health monitor here and we have our system HTTP monitor up here. If I click on this, I get a better idea on what the issue is. You're speaking plain HTTP to an SSL enabled server port. So it's not liking that it's an HTTP monitor because it's an HTTPS application. So that's pretty clear. Let's check out what's going on with this 1.1.1. We'll drop down the system HTTP like we did before. Connections timed out. So this 1.1.1 server actually doesn't exist. So of course it's not gonna work. So the connection just times out. This is how we can see what's happening to those backend servers. So this is very useful when you're troubleshooting. When we get into troubleshooting, you'll see a more in depth example of this and how to troubleshoot it. The last thing I wanna note is if we ever want to look at more specific logs. So in my case, I already had it enabled, but I must emphasize when you're troubleshooting, it is very valuable to enable non-significant logs if you can't find the issue um, that you're currently experiencing. You might, so if there's an anomaly, maybe you'll enable non-significant log. An example might be you want to look at a specific cookie why isn't my client persisting to that backend server? It's getting a 200 response, but it's not persisting. This is where non-significant logs might come in handy because yeah, the traffic is getting 200 responses and you, you just wanna see those cookies. You wanna see what cookie is being passed by that client. Is it the same cookie or is it a new cookie? If it's a new cookie, that would explain why you're not persisting to the same backend server. So when you get to the troubleshooting section, we will cover analytics a lot more, as well as troubleshooting pool or virtual service issues. So I recommend if this wasn't enough, just wait for that troubleshooting section because it should cover everything I've missed. I hope this information was valuable and if you wanna play for yourself, please check out our hands-on labs. Stay tuned for more of our NSX Advanced Load Balancer Operation Workshop videos and take care.